it's a real push to have to call that out when we see it and to back people up when it happens. There's nothing worse than feeling like you're not in a situation of power or you're not in a situation of, you know, feeling really confident where you are. The real detriment and the real problem is, is that we're creating these situations where oftentimes this is occurring much more often to younger people, to women, um, to people of color. And then we're getting this situation where then they're going to be leaving because they don't feel comfortable. And that's not correct. The fact that those kinds of experiences are so common for, you know, people like me, I think that I've just gotten very rehearsed at not internalizing it. And that has really turned into, you know, my practice of identifying identifying white mediocrity. It's easier to kind of mentally file the research in terms of the famous people and not pay much attention to all the other names on the paper of the people who have done often more of the work or at least quite a big part of the work and that's another way that people get overlooked. Sometimes this happens because of lack of awareness because of lack of how actions are coming across to other people and how that makes them feel. Because the truth is, the objective standards that we use to determine if someone's good at their job or not, those objective standards are really trotted out when the person is not a straight white man. So many senior faculty, people that have gone on to be provost, people that have gone on to win lifetime achievement awards within their field, they all have these stories. And many of them at the end of their careers say that they are exhausted. They are absolutely exhausted by trying to quote unquote outperform to counter that narrative. Where my concern really lies is to get educators and really people in general in dominant identity categories to hold themselves and each other to higher standards. I am not very interested in my disadvantage as a black woman in this country that's set up to privilege straight white men. I'm much more interested in the unearned advantage of those straight white men. Because if it's about my disadvantage, then I have to do something to prove my worthiness or whatever. And we're not gonna make any progress doing that. It's worth people just having an open mind when they talk to anyone, but particularly if they might have an unconscious bias to assume that you know, a professor or a scientist looks a particular way, just to be aware of that. People don't ex expect a professor to look Chicana. They don't expect, you know, a professor to wear hoops. They don't expect, you know, a professor to have curly hair or darker skin. How can you actually challenge the environment you're in in a way that makes room for other people and at least makes it easier to breathe for other people in those spaces? It's really important to be able to to stand up and, and call it as it is because that's not a great way to interact with someone at a conference. Protect your health, protect your wellness, engage in self-care. But we might make some progress if we can get white people, if we can get straight people, if we can get normatively able people, right? To think about what are your unearned advantages and how can you make this country less hostile for more people? We have to support each other. We have to continue to brag about each other's accomplishments, elevate other women for what they're doing, um, because, you know, playing quiet about our achievements doesn't save us from the overall bias. It's not about trying to be the smartest or showing anyone up. It's literally about connection. And the best way you're going to connect with someone is by actually asking questions about them, what they do, and try to understand what they're doing. And oh my gosh, that can actually result in this amazing collaboration that you might never have thought. Don't miss those opportunities. Don't be that guy. <laughs>